Welcome to Las Vegas, where we're live from Structures Research's Infrastructure Summit 2024. I am now joined by Chuck McBride, CEO of Atmosphere Data Centers. And Chuck, it's a pleasure speaking to you. Great to see you. Uh, yeah. How is Vegas treating you? It's been, it's been fun. You know, <laughs> anytime you get to come to Vegas for a conference, it's enjoy. I went to the Sphere last night, oh. which is powered by NVIDIA chips and AI, right? And it's really neat yeah. to be in there. So that was a, a neat experience while we're here. Yeah, I didn't manage to see it this time. It's on the cards for next year, because we'll be back here in October next year. So. <laughs> um, one, speaking of the conference now and on what's happening in the corridors here, there's a lot of conversation around, of course, the boom of AI and what's happening across the US uh, under the, it's 42,000 megawatts of power uh, available under construction and in the pipeline. I mean, it's massive, massive numbers. Before we delve into the, into the specifics of it and uh, then, of course, into what Atmosphere is doing, mm -hmm. how would you paint a picture of the state of the market right now? What are the hurdles to developing all this property? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think at a high level, it's a land grab, right? So it's a, it's a can you go get land and power secured in strategic locations where people want to be? I do think there's other development issues with communities now pushing back on data centers, and we can go more into that in our conversation today. And we've, we've been able to help drive some of that with the community aspect and the, the social side of it, uh, which we'll touch on later. But um, I think it's, it's mostly, you know, we need to bring data centers to where the power is now. Mm -hmm. And so some of what we're doing is taking old stranded assets, power plants that were shut down and bringing the data center to that location. Mm -hmm. So pretty interesting. Okay, I guess power, big topic again. Um, not only just the power, it's the sustainable side of power and adopting renewable energy. How can data centers, especially into the back of high performance computing and AI, how can data center operators really invest and deploy uh, climate friendly solutions in their data centers? What, what's happening in that, on that front? Yeah, so I'll give you like a little shameless pitch. I'm wearing my, my Atmosphere Data Center shirt here. <laughs> but, you know, when I created the company, the whole idea was to build the greenest data centers on Earth um, and really help the world with sustainability. And, and a lot, I think a lot of people say that. Uh, but, you know, I read through a lot of the competitors, you know, what I would call marketing fluff. And I think what's different about us is we've created technologies and different solutions that no one else has. Mm to try to really change the game for our builds and the hyperscalers and help them uh, with their carbon neutral and carbon negative goals. Um, you know, the whole thought behind atmosphere, right, was a data center is an atmosphere. So mm. it's a temperature and humidity controlled environment. So you yeah. walk in, it's an atmosphere. Yeah. Or kind of like here in Vegas, right? It's, it's a cool climate. atmosphere, yeah. right? But, <laughs> but also the, the atmosphere is where the clouds live, mm. right? And clouds live in our data centers, right? And AI, so we're, we're the right atmosphere for your cloud and AI. Mm. And some of that is with AI data centers, machine learning data centers, the density enables us to actually build a smaller building. So we're putting more megawatts into a smaller mm -hmm. space, mm -hmm. right? That actually helps with you know, embodied carbon because we're building less of a building. Mm -hmm. So there's less concrete, less steel where there's a lot of embodied carbon, less transportation to the site with all those materials, mm -hmm. right? Less emissions. Um, and there's there's a whole lot, a host of things that we're doing. We have the lowest energy cooling system for AI, liquid cooling, so we use less energy. Our PUE is 1.08 to 1.10 all hmm. year long. So by using less energy for cooling and for the data center, hmm. as you know, power generation is a big emitter, right? Just where the generation stations yeah. are and what the fuel source is. So we're then less of an emitter in that hmm. aspect. We're also manufacturing our modular infrastructure at integrators close to the data center campus. So that again, we minimize emissions on the way to the data center build. Mm, mm. So there's just a whole, a lot of things we're doing, but mm. we can talk more. To, 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 to create a new ecosystem, yeah. that has to be more sustainable. But if we look outside of the data center, energy costs are also going up. How can operators mitigate the, the rising cost of energy? Um, how, how do you plan for that? I mean, we still have at least another year for a bit of uncertainty. Uh, around energy costs, and there's a lot of other costs like interest rates as well, but just yeah. focus on rising energy costs. How can yeah, you mitigate we, that? So we started Atmosphere Data Centers. We also started Atmosphere.Energy. Hmm. And so we, our goal is to also be an energy provider to help utilities at our campuses to be a positive energy producer for hmm. the, and help the grid, right, and help our communities that we're in. So, you know, our goal is, is SMRs. <laughs> we... Hmm. We own energyforai.com, we own smr.energy. We want to be an SMR provider at our campuses, providing power mm. to the data centers where they live on our campus. So, mm. you know, that's a little ways away with NRC and, mm. you know, some of the regulatory environment we're in with nuclear. 
but it seems to have bipartisan support now, hmm. uh, which is exciting to see. It's going to take a few more years, but we think then we can solve for it in the years hmm. to come. Hmm. And a lot of education of the general yeah. population. Yeah. Uh, y you actually mentioned regulatory, regulatory um, not challenges, but you mentioned regulation. Is that, and beyond energy at this, at this stage, is, that re is regulation being a pain point in the US right now? Is, like, is the government getting too involved or the, the, the states, the different states are getting too involved, the government, the, the governors? Well, so the, so like let's take nuclear for example. Even mm. like the US Navy has hundreds of what I'd call modular nuclear reactors, right? Mm. On ships and submarines, right? That mm. are working. They're working, they have hundreds of working SMRs. Mm. And if you connected those to transmission lines, mm you know, you'd have data center power potentially, right? Mm -hmm. So the same idea, but what the Navy's done so well, you know, needs to be done on land and at these campuses. Mm -hmm. um, but the NRC, you know, is, is, has to be funded, right? And so there, there's environmental groups that sue you mm -hmm. if you try to build a nuclear reactor. And so you get sued, there's a lot of litigation that happens in our country, and that's why it takes years. Like, it's taking, on average, in the U.S., 10 to 15 years to get a nuclear reactor built. Oh. I think in the last 10 years, only one that was built was Vogel hmm. in Georgia, right? Yeah. So we just need to move faster. We need to have less regulation and be able to clear through hurdles to build hmm. these facilities. Yeah, and especially in the place that we are right now in our industry, 10, 15 years is way too long. It's too long <laughs> we, are looking AI. we need, eight, we need power two <laughs> tomorrow. years, not, not, not four years. Yeah. Or years. Um, and then talking about site selection as well, because I mean, the US does have a lot of land, but there are places in the country which are becoming quite overwhelmed mm -hmm. with this in constructions, like Northern Virginia, for example, which is right. still the largest market in the world. Right. How do you approach site selection, and not just from a power perspective, also from, I don't know, tax incentives, uh, w everything that goes into the mix of site selection, how do you approach that? Yeah, so what I would say is those with cash right now have gone out and gobbled up a lot of the land and power. And so, like I was saying earlier, you're going to have to go bring data centers to where the hmm. power is. So even if it's in the middle of nowhere, you know, we're seeing people go to North Dakota, right? Hmm. We didn't think data centers would go there, but because you have excess natural gas and wind on the grid, I think South North Dakota's <laughs> seventh in energy production, but 49th in offtake. So they don't use <laughs> a lot of the energy they produce. So there's a lot of power there. So you go somewhere like that. We'd like what Applied Digital there that did there. I think that's interesting. I think you'll see more of that as long as the fibers there and <laughs> the workload can be there. And so we're strategically, I can't share all of our secret sauce, but we have some East Coast locations where we found stranded power. Um, we found assets where there was a substation, hmm. there were transmission lines. Uh, example, like we're, we're turning old, dirty, pollutive assets like coal-fired power plants into green, clean data centers. That's a big part of our hmm. atmosphere pitch. And um, we think there'll be more of that. Hmm. Okay, I mean, I know you can't go too deep into locations, but what can you share geography-wise um, of, of what's the plan? Yeah, so we're gonna go, uh, we're gonna do a few on the East Coast and then we have a large campus area in the West Coast to kind of connect our country here in the U.S., hmm. east to west. And then we will go to APAC, okay. which we see is underserved from a population. So hmm. Southeast Asia is huge, right? Hmm. And places like Vietnam have, you know, 30 million people with mobile devices hmm. and they're young. It's very unconnected. Right? It's, it's under connected from a, the internet standpoint and from a cloud standpoint. So places like that. So APAC, and then we'll go to Europe and hmm. then Latam. So we have a global domination strategy. <laughs> we, gotta, we gotta get there first. We gotta get going. What's, what, what, what's the timeline looking like? Two, three, four, five years? Yeah, so I think, I think we'll focus here on the US market for the next four years hmm. and then go elsewhere. Okay, so it's a long-term rollout. Yeah, it's a yeah. long-term <laughs> goal, yeah. Um, and then, I mean, I guess, then spe talking specifically about the US, of course, you will cut some ribbons uh, in the next few years. How do you then scale everything up to cope with demand whilst you then go around the world to build more facilities? Yeah, so I, I'll tell you something interesting. You know, we, we started our thesis was that we heard from a lot of customers that they, you know, some of the smaller customers, right, that aren't the big cloud guys, hmm. but they might need four, eight, 10, 12 megawatts at a time. Um, they, were, they weren't able to get capacity because a hyperscaler took all 300 megawatts at a campus, or now that campus is now a gigawatt, hmm. let's say. So our thesis was we could go to these infill sites around the country where we found 30 to 50 megawatts. We had substation, there's transmission lines, there's power there, there's water. Um, our, our technology doesn't use any water, mm -hmm. but in general. 
Um, and so you, you're doing site selection. So our thesis was find these 30 to 50 megawatt sites, build those, and lease them to those customers. As we got going with that strategy, we found out we had customers saying, hey, I don't need just 30. Can you build me 900 megawatts? You know, almost a gigawatt, right? So, and then we realized there's almost just as much brain damage mm. in getting the zoning done and entitlements and permitting and all the community aspect to doing 30 megawatts as it is to do 900 or 1,000 yeah. megawatts. And so you're almost the same amount of work, same team staffing wise. Mm. To, so we just decided, let's go build gigawatt campuses. That's what customers started asking yeah. for us. And so we now have a few gigawatt campuses under development um, and it's exciting right now what, what this world is. Mm. The world has changed a lot, as you know, in the last couple of years. Yeah, and I mean, in the last few months we started talking about one gigawatt campuses, but then suddenly you were talk we are talking about three, four gigawatt campuses as well. So we went from, it used to be very big at 10 megawatts to 100 megawatts was huge. And now one gigawatt in the space of a few months, it's three, four, five, six gigawatts of campuses, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, which is mad. Yeah. Um, can you just give us a, an idea of the, the, the financial structure behind the, the, the company? So who's sponsoring? Is it private equity? Um, is it US money? Is money from Europe? Like wh wh where does the cash come from? Yeah, so uh, we are closing you know, some big transactions on Folks that want to help fuel our, you know, every building we, every hundred megawatt building we build is a billion dollars. Yeah. So we have groups that want to fuel us with multiple billions to help us buy that land and help us transact mm. and help us build the buildings. We're working on closing some joint ventures right now, so I can't talk in yeah. detail about it right now. But give us a couple of months to yeah. close on some of these, and we can yeah. talk more about it. But it's it's all U.S. U.S. Um, cash. Okay. We went out to groups. So infrastructure funds, institutional, and then private equity funds that didn't have a data center platform. Uh, we got down to 14 groups, 14 investors that we really liked. And then we started narrowing down who could help us in the short term, who wanted to go long term, who wanted to help more on the land and the hmm. building, uh, building these data centers, right? And who wanted to help more of the top co level um, at the, the holding company level. So. We've been sorting all that out the last few. I've been on the road <laughs> the last few months raising capital, yeah. <laughs> and it's it's been a lot of fun. And, uh, and I've had a lot of work as well. <laughs> yeah, and it's, I tell you, we are in the hottest space in the world right now. We have not received a no from anyone oh, wow. on cash. It's just, it's always about when they could come in, or, or mm. you know, if you go raise a hundred million first, we'll come in later, yeah. kind of a thing. So it's been like that, and it's been um, a good problem to have. Yeah, and I'll tell you what's really interesting. I, I'll, I did want to share this. So <laughs> recently was at a zoning hearing for one of the properties that we have under exclusivity. And, you know, to move it, to get zoned for data center use and renewable energy use. And the community asked, and I know you were going to ask me this, yeah. so I'll just start there. They, they asked us a ton of questions hmm. around, you know, how much water are you using? Uh, how much noise do these data centers Make. produce yeah. you know as, as there's a national park that's nearby so as they walk by on a trail or a hmm. bike trail or a running trail how much noise are these data centers producing and emitting and then uh, you know are you taking the power away from our homes and schools like hmm. are, is the data center going to drain I'm, am i going to have power at my house and they were just asking all they, they asked us what is a data center you know who who's in it what's in it who are your clients hmm. You know, and they asked a ton of details just even around what it is, and they, they referenced Northern Virginia as an mm. example of, hey, we heard communities don't like these facilities. What's mm. going on? And they just, we were able to say, hey, we run really quiet because with our atmosphere system, it's liquid cooled for mm. AI. Mm. And so because of that, it runs really quiet. We don't have giant fans and mm. really noisy systems. Um, so we run quiet, we run really efficient. We talked about our energy efficiency, our low PUE, so we're, we have lowest energy. Um, and we talked about how we're gonna help. We, we're adjacent to us as a battery energy hmm. storage system. So it's actually helping the grid, right? And stabilize the grid. And they just loved, they said, so wait a minute, you're taking a coal fired power plant and turning it into a green data center and helping the grid? Hmm. So. <laughs> This is a good story. Like you're yeah. taking a dirty pollutive asset and turning it into a green data center. And we believe with our emissions capture system that we have, that communities love the atmosphere story. We're better for the Earth's atmosphere. 
mm -hmm. and that's what's enabling us to get community approvals. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of com community education that needs to happen, and that's not just exclusive to the US. You look at yeah. Europe, you look at some place in Asia like Singapore, yeah. um, there needs to be more education. Uh, but uh, Chuck, so we are now at mm -hmm. Infrastructure 2024. Uh, we'll be back in 12 months. What is the one thing you would like the market to adopt, change its mindset? What's the one thing you, needs, you think needs to happen in the next 12 months market-wise? You know, I was in one of these sessions earlier and somebody asked about sustainability and they said, yeah, we just need to put more recycling bins in the break room <laughs> at the data center. And I just thought to myself, you that's know, quite an answer. <laughs> we need to do much better than that as an industry. Uh, we need to be viewed as the green sustainable industry. Um, and I think we need to drive change mm. with that. And uh, that's the biggest thing is just be, we need to be greener and better for our communities. And we can't just say we're planting trees or doing yeah. offsets on the grid with carbon offsets. We, you know, we need, we, we really need to come together and provide carbon free base load power with nuclear. Hmm. Is, is there, that's the biggest thing I'd ask the industry is let's push Washington and our politicians to drive nuclear as fast hmm. as we can. Hmm. Yeah, and we've seen the shift as well across the Atlantic. Um, and we'll see it in Asia. Um, this conversation, even in Indonesia, is now looking at nuclear as well. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be very interesting. But uh, Chuck McBride, thanks so much for talking to me. Yeah. Um, as for our home, thank you for watching. And do check our website and social media for the latest news on digital infrastructure, finance, and investment from across the globe. At the Tech Capital, you lead, we report. Bye for now.